Hi there. Uh, we're really, really glad that you are listening to this sermon um, and we pray that it will encourage you and that you will grow through it in your faith. Um, we would also like for you to follow along in your Bible because that's how this teaching resource will be most useful to you. Um, this is also not meant to be used on its own. So if you're not regularly meeting with a local church family, we really encourage you to do so. Um, and if you are ever in or near the Lorraine area, we would encourage you to pop in and visit us on a Sunday morning. We'd love to meet you. Um, also, if you would like to support the Lord's work um, in and through the Emmanuel family, um, you can visit emmanuelpe.org slash give. Good morning, Emmanuel Church. A warm welcome to you all and to our viewers online again. It's good to be with you all. We come to that point where we're going to read the scriptures, and it comes from Acts chapter 15, and I'll read from verses 6 through to 21. Uh, while you're going to that point of the Bible, I just want to remind you that love conquers all things. In the midst of all the trials and the tribulations that we face today, love conquers all things. Jesus loved us so much that he died for us. Acts chapter 15, verses 6 through to 21. The apostles and the elders gathered to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers and sisters, you are aware that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. The whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describe all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they stopped speaking, James responded, Brothers and sisters, listen to me. Simeon has reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this, as it is written, After these things I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again, so the rest of humanity may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, declares the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God, but instead we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from blood. For since ancient times, Moses had those who proclaim him in every city, and every Sabbath day he is read aloud in the synagogues. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And thank you, Pastor Paul, uh, for reading for us. Uh, good morning. It's really great uh, to see you guys here this morning. It's really great to have you online, uh, streaming in. Uh, if you are joining us, I know there's still so many people. While we've seen certainly our, our kind of national numbers uh, on the decline in the way of COVID infections, um, just so many folk uh, in this last week. Um, I'm certainly aware of folk within our church um, who are uh, still struggling uh, with uh, some directly, some just with the uh, effects uh, of the pandemic. Um, so many uh, missing loved ones. Um, just before I, we dive back into uh, this passage that Paul read from us, uh, Chad mentioned our AGM. Uh, I know for many of you, you know, often we hear the words AGM, you know, annual general meeting, and we think, oh, you know, business meeting, oh, one of those things one just has to do. Uh, I want to encourage you not to view it uh, in that light. Uh, this is the business of the church, and it's your church. Um, come along, uh, quick in a nutshell, what we're going to be doing at this AGM, we're trying to streamline uh, it as much as possible. Uh, most of the reports will be in written format that you can take in a booklet um, home with you, either via PDF or 
Uh, there'll be a few printed copies. Um, but three main things we want to do uh, on Wednesday night is uh, we want to reflect uh, on the Lord's faithfulness over the last 18 months since our last AGM. Uh, it's amazing. You, you know, we often, you, you kind of, or certainly, you know, we have those days in ministry and, you know, frustration and questioning what's going on. And I'm seeing these reports come in and, you know, reflecting on the various ministries that has taken place. And the Lord's been at work, man. Um, and so we want to we reflect on that. We want to thank the Lord. Um, and we want to, you know, delight in that as a church together. The second thing we're going to do uh, is vote uh, for council members. Uh, I've been incredibly encouraged by our Emmanuel Church Council. We've been gifted with godly, humble uh, leaders. Do, do you know that's one sign of the Lord's uh, kindness on a church, is gifting us with faithful leaders. Not talking about the, the few pastors here, but our, our council, our leadership. Um, so there's a few new faces. There's a few who are standing for re-election. Um, and we, it's, you know, that's, that's for you as the church um, to have your say. Uh, to vote for those council members. And then lastly, we're going to spend just a few minutes diving into our plans and some goals for the coming years, our vision, um, as we say. So come along. Um, if you can come in person, um, we do understand uh, the various uh, challenges that, you know, that we're currently in. Uh, there will be a live stream. The voting, though, can only take place here in, in person. Um, uh, and so you know, that's just the, the one part of that. Now, Back to Acts chapter 15, uh, Paul, Pastor Paul read the passage for us today, but it was the same Pastor Paul last week. If you were here, you might recall he set the basis uh, of what was being spoken about uh, in the passage today. Right at the beginning of Acts chapter 15, uh, we read that there were some men, uh, some Jews, Jewish Christians or Jewish converts to Christianity who traveled from Judea uh, to the Gentile believers uh, and who uh, taught them with the, with the intention of teaching and encouraging them to be circumcised uh, as new Christians according to the Jewish law. Um, now, this was considered to be a serious matter. Um, and so Paul and Barnabas traveled to Jerusalem. You know, they didn't just call an Uber. Uh, it meant uh, a few uh, quite a, a kind of a costly travel uh, and so forth. They traveled to Jerusalem, and we've kind of got this feed into the council room, the meeting room of this leadership of the local church in terms of how they address uh, this challenge. Now, one thing uh, very important, Paul said a number of important uh, statements last week, but one crucially important statement, uh, he set the foundation in reminding us that circumcision was a sign of the old covenant. Some of you might know it as a sign of the Abrahamic covenant, a sign that God uh, had used for his chosen people, uh, Israel. And, um, and so just important, you know, to keep that in mind. Remember that uh, from last week. Now, today, Paul and Barnabas address this issue. And for many, many of us, it may just seem like a theological issue. In other words, yes, you know, this kind of plays out in terms of theology and so forth and that. But, you know, I I'm not too stressed about being circumcised. Uh, no one's putting pressure on, you, you know, certainly... Uh, no one at Emmanuel is pressuring anybody. Imagine if that was part of our newcomers, new members' classes. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're very few guys. Um, but, you know, that's not happening here. But you might not think it matters much for us. But here's what I want you to know from the start to understand, and then we're going to develop and build on this, is that the gospel is that we are not saved by what we do. It's all about what Jesus has done for us. But what we see today is there's something in understanding that what we do matters. Do you get that? We're not saved by what we do. It's all God. It's all the atoning work of Jesus Christ. But what we do matters. So let's kind of get into it and see why I say that, why I say that's the case. Test me. You know, check me. Don't, don't take my word for it. Open the Bible, have the scriptures in front of you, and let's, let's be uh, grown together as we do this. Now, uh, a few years, or, or I'm, uh, you know, some of you might maybe regard me as a bit of a young buck, uh, but in my few years of life, I've made two kind of fairly big moves which have taken me along to new communities. Uh, I yeah, had the opportunity to live and work in a few different parts of South Africa, but the first big move 
and it's pretty cool to have my dad here today because maybe he can remember something of it, uh, was when this coastal beach bum, P.E. boy, who was toting long baggy shorts and scraggly hair, can, can you still remember that guy, Adrian? Okay. Um, scraggly hair was driven up to agricultural college in the Natal Midlands by his dad. Uh, and I'll never forget, I was literally wearing, you know, remember how board shorts, baggies used to go below the knees and you know, slip slops and a t-shirt and that? We walk into this, this kind of orientation room at the Sadara Agricultural College, Natal Midlands. I look around and with the exception of a, a few ladies and maybe one or two more formally dressed lecturers, literally the whole room, students, parents, many dads, farmers obviously, the whole room, khaki shorts, and short rugby shorts, uh, khaki shirts, and short rugby shorts, tight pants, you know? And I remember thinking to myself, shucks, maybe I missed something, you know, about the dress code of this meeting, but we sat through it, great time. My dad, who was, uh, had, we'd driven all the way up uh, to, to Natal, to, it's a place uh, in Hilton, just north of Peter Maritzburg, uh, was dropping me off there, you know, doing the fatherly thing, kicking me out the car, you're on your own now, son. He didn't do that. But after that, we went down to uh, the mall to get a few things. And I remember walking through the mall, seeing more and more people wearing those tight rugby shorts and cocky shirts. And I was thinking, gosh, what's going on here? But you know what? It didn't take long. <laughs> and yours truly was wearing his own khaki shirt. Uh, I tried to find a photo or two from my, my college days, but those were before the days of camera phones and that. So this was me on the farm a few years ago. And uh, I like my khaki shirts. Fast forward uh, 12, 13 years or so, and I find myself again walking into an orientation room at another college, but this time a theological college, a Bible college in the city of Cape Town. And guess what? You know, the baggies maybe weren't quite as long, but similar, you know, maybe. He had a little bit more khaki in his closet, but same old P.E. Beach Boy Andre, baggy shorts, T-shirts, you know, um, slip stops. It was Musenberg, um, Surfer's Paradise in the middle of summer. And I walk in, and there again, you know, something was going on there, something different. Not khaki shirts, but you'll see what, what we kind of assimilated into a little bit later. The, the academic theological world for me, certainly, it seemed to be well-dressed uh, and formally dressed uh, as such. Um, I, I do a bit of a disclaimer. I know, Janine didn't ask me, but I know if I, I don't tell you that she was heavily pregnant with our youngest daughter, Willow, there, I will, <laughs> I'll get in, in trouble. Um, but I did adapt, you know. Both in the farmlands of Natal, and here's the point, both in the farmlands of Natal and... Uh, in the lecture rooms and library of George Whitfield College. Do you know that? No one at any stage said to me, hey, my friend, you better dress like this, you better talk like this. No, but there was no expectation. There was one day a week where we had to dress formally at, at Bible College, but, but nobody said, you know, this is what a, 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 a theology student looks like, or this is what a farmer dresses. But... Over time, I changed. Now, I can't remember, I don't ever remember thinking, you know, thinking in my mind, you know, it's a case of keeping up with the Joneses, or, or I never felt like an issue of acceptance, or, you know, that people wouldn't take me seriously. But what I do remember thinking is I remember thinking along the lines of, of saying that, you know, this is just what farmers do, or this is just what theology students do. This is how we dress. This is how we, you know, what, what we wear. And friends, the reason why I'm kind of telling you this, making that point, is that for us as Christians, many times, whether we say something or not, it's often what we are doing that can subtly say something about what we believe. Do you understand that? It's often what we are doing that can very subtly say something about what we belief. And we see something of that being addressed uh, by Paul and Barnabas in this circumcision issue. Now in Acts, this uh, is the concern that lies behind Paul and Barnabas going to Jerusalem to clarify this issue of the teaching of the need to be circumcised. Uh, 
and we see that they took it seriously. They, they entered into the council, the, this early church, Jerusalem church, uh, and there was hot debate, you know, kind of heated, tussling back and forward is uh, what the original language tells us. Uh, and what we have to remember here, before we even get into it, is we, we have to remember that this wasn't Jews against Christians, you know, like we might know those terms from the Gospels and other times in Acts and that. No, this was Jewish Christians, Jewish believers who were debating with other Christians. Those who took themselves to teach the Gentiles that they had to be circumcised were Jewish converts who meant well, who in their own way, you know, were, were showing that they cared for the converts because they thought this stuff matters, and so they were wanting to make sure that these new converts, Gentiles, not Jews, Gentiles, were doing the right thing. And so, friends, this wasn't an outside church thing. This was in the church. This was a church issue, and it was serious. Verse 6, you know, we see what was being debated here. The, the apostles and the elders gathered to consider this matter, and after they had much debate, Peter stood up. Now remember, this is Peter the apostle. Peter, a Jew or a Jewish convert. And see what he said. And God verse 8, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. So he says it's God who knows their hearts, and it's him, it's he that has cleansed their hearts, just like ours, and there's no difference. There's no distinction between us and them. Then Barnabas uh, jumps in and he describes how him and Paul, remember how they've been on their first missionary trip, how they've uh, preached the gospel to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles, and they've seen the Holy Spirit at work. And then James, Jesus' half-brother, who's most likely the leader of the church, who's chairing uh, this council, he brings them back to God's word, to the prophecy of Amos. Amos 9, verse 11 and 12 is what he's quoted here. And he says, clearly this is God's plan from Scripture that Jesus, the one from David's line, would make it possible for even the Gentiles to seek the Lord. So you know, setting the basis that this was God's plan, this was prophesied, that these Gentiles would come to the Lord. Now this wordy kind of punchy debate moving along, and what we see is that it all starts to build off of this one statement that Peter makes in verse 10. Have a look. Peter says, Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way they are. There. Peter, himself a Jew, says it. Don't test God by placing a burden on these converts. These guys who have already been saved by grace. Saved by grace, the very way that we, same way that we have. In other words, they don't need this. And he makes the point by saying, you know, Peter himself saying, well, we as ethnic Jews, in a legalistic sense, couldn't even bear that, uh, bear that same burden. Of the law. And now, you know, there's an inconsistency here. You're saying, you know, let's place it on those guys. So don't burden them with it. Don't insist on them keeping the law as well in the same kind of legalistic manner. Now, the reality for most of us is, like I said, you know, we don't think of the, the issue of circumcision, you know, personally. I don't think it really matters for us. So we can just gloss over it. But there's a crucially important principle here that no Christian should miss. And that is what Peter said, and James as well. Don't, first of all, don't choke the new guy. That was James's ruling, verse 19. Therefore, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God. So it's saying, don't burden new believers with anything that's additional to the gospel. Don't cause difficulties. 
You know, don't put boundaries uh, in their place. Uh, he's saying, you know, he's not saying don't disciple them and grow them and that, but be careful about how we might burden them. In other words, James and Peter were saying we mustn't let anything get in the way of these new converts' faith. We must be clear that it is God who saves. The gospel is the power of God to save and not hinder their growth by placing extra expectations on them, but rather help them. Now, friends, it's important for us as individuals, but as a church, that's also crucially important. See, we must do our best to ensure that nothing gets in the way of the gospel for new believers. That's why we as preachers, uh, why we work hard at explaining and teaching the Bible. You know, not just knowing what it says, but, but articulating it and explaining. We don't want people, you know, to get kind of lost uh, in meanings. That's why we regularly think about our facilities, you know, here, physical facilities, church property and buildings and so forth, and our, even our online presence nowadays. Uh, not that these are ultimate focuses by any means, but we need to make sure that we aren't subtly creating any barriers or stops for new believers to come in and respond to the gospel and grow in the gospel. I mean, think of the irony of it. I, I'm so thankful we're a praying church and we have a few prayer teams here and regularly we're praying. In fact, those were some of the prayers shared this morning and at the 8 o'clock service, that we are praying that we are faithful to the Great Commission. In other words, that we are making disciples, calling them in. And you see the irony of that, if we're doing that, we're praying for that, but then, you know, very subtly and sometimes even uh, um, not knowing it, placing barriers in the way. We as Christians, we have to think about the kind of lives, you know, that we project to others. Think about the fact that if we're not honest about our own sin, you know, not honest about the own difficulties and struggles of our own lives, if we think that it's all just about living a fake, manicured, Stepford wife-like, you know, kind of keeping up the appearance all the time, just smiles and big Bibles under our arms and, you know, happy family. It's not that there's anything wrong with that. But if we're not honest about the difficulties, well, then that can be a barrier. That can be a barrier for somebody who says, I can't do that. I'm so messed up. My brokenness doesn't fit in here. That would be tragic. See, we have to be careful as well that we don't make it difficult for those of different ethnic backgrounds because our leadership structures and our worship styles don't reflect the mixed context of the community that we're in. We've got to think about these things. We've got to pray about them. We've got to seek guidance for them. And friends, you know, the world we live in today, I don't want to make it difficult for that person who's struggling with same-sex attraction, who's turning to God, to see me treating their sin any differently as I treat my own sin. In other words, we have to be careful that we're not stigmatizing the sin of others and just overlooking the tragedies of our own sin and the grace that we need ourselves. Friends, this matters what we say and importantly what we do matters and that we can never let or, or, or make it difficult for someone who is turning to God by placing extra pressure on them. Don't choke the new guy or, or, or girl. Now it's interesting that after James and the council decide on the, import, the importance of not burdening those coming to faith, we see they write a letter to explain their response. Uh, and they send this letter advising the Gentile believers on a few requirements. So have a look a few verses down from verse 28. We see what it actually says. It says, For it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours not to place further burdens on you beyond these requirements, that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immora immorality. You will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. Farewell. Very Yoda-ish kind of finishing there. But you see, you see what's, we've got to be careful here, because what, what, what can it seem that they're saying? 
They might seem to say, don't worry about circumcision, you know, one requirement of the Old Testament law. But here are two others. Flee sexual immorality and keep some of the food purity laws. My friends, what we have to understand is that as Christians, we never pick and choose the parts of the Bible that we want to obey. See, that wasn't the case here by any means. They weren't choosing a few Old Testament laws to live by and then throwing the rest out, you know. And by the way, that's a very much a modern argument against Christianity, that our view of sexuality is something we've chosen and, you know, because guys don't grow beards and frontlets and that we've thrown the rest out. I'd like to press in more on that, but we'll, we'll do that another time. But you see, what we have to understand and what, what this council was addressing as they gave this letter of advisement to the Gentile believers, is they were showing us that there is a consistent moral reality tied up with the very nature of who God is, and that that was reflected in the Old Testament law, and that it's consistent with his people today. Consistent moral reality. God is unchanging. So if you go to, God, to, to God's word, to see who he is. You're going to see that in the Old Testament law, and that's going to be consistent with who we are as his people today. So for those Gentiles living 2,000 years ago, it's not that, you know, that, that sexual immorality was, was off the table, but lying, cheating, and, and stealing was, was fair game. No, we, we know historically the context in that day and age was that lying, cheating, stealing, you know, those other kinds of sins as such, th th those... Those were respected. But extramarital sex, man, that was just something that was done in the pagan world. And so the Jerusalem Council, they're writing this letter to Gentiles, speaking into that context and saying, hey guys, we have a moral reality to live out according to who our God is. You know? Hearts are made new by the living God hearts of his people will reflect that reality. But it doesn't stop there. That's just kind of part of it. What we see in that is they're saying that they're, they're advising something along the lines of living consistent with a cleansed heart. You know, no flee sexual immorality. In other words, first off, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the second part, when the council said keep some of these purity laws, is they knew that they were speaking to Gentile believers who lived in community with new Jewish converts, with Jewish Christians. And remember the reality of Jews, is that their whole life was about keeping the law. Uh, these were men and women who were still living as they had their whole lives, and who in many instances found Gentile food to be a stumbling block. And so effectively, effectively what was being said here was they were saying, consider your Jewish brothers and sisters. In other words, love your neighbors as yourselves. Live out that transformed, cleansed heart. You're renewed and free from the law. But never let that barrier be a freedom to others. Uh, uh, let that freedom be a barrier to others. That's Paul's argument, 1 Corinthians 8. Now, while it, you know, I said, it might seem like this just deals with circumcision, uh, illicit sex, and, and strangled food, there's a very subtle warning in this passage here for every church and for every Christian, for every believer, and that's the subtle danger of drifting. So you guys, uh, I think many of you know us, myself and Janine and our girls, we, we enjoy fishing. Even if you don't know us, but we've come maybe bumped into one another on social media, you'll see plenty of fishing pictures there. And um, something that we like to do, um, we're fortunate our family's got a little cabin boat that we like to go fishing in. And uh, we'll launch the boat, get the boat on the river, the lagoon or estuary, uh, and it'll always involve two stops. The first stop is along the way, we'll stop to get bait. Um, and then we'll kind of move along and find a nice fishing spot, uh, often more so depending on what mood the girls are in um, and the tides and, and that kind of thing. 
Now, my daughters love to remind me of one particular time. We, we, we went through this rigmarole. Anyone who's been fishing with three small kids will know that by the time you've got the kids in the boat and the boat on the water, that, that you know, patience levels are, are being tested. Uh, and so we get to that first spot where we want to, want to go to get some bait. Everyone hops out, and I think, man, you know, the tide's pushing. I, I don't have time in that, so I just pull the boat up onto the bank. I don't need an anchor. We'll just be a few minutes. Hopefully, you can kind of see where this is going. Tide had been coming in, and I'm mindful of this. We moved down the bank as we were pumping prawns, kept an eye on the boat. It didn't look like it was moving much. Um, but in reality, it was slowly starting to drift and drift and, you know, slowly starting to move out, kind of casting my eye, watching the prawns, until probably 10, 15 minutes later, Willow says, Dad, is that our boat floating down the river? And I realized it was. And I realized I had to swim. And I realized it was cold. But I got there. But what we see in this is that there's a danger in small, subtle drift. Now, I've adapted this list uh, in terms of the danger of the drift from a, another pastor, theologian, name of J.D. Greer. I've kind of simplified it a bit. But you see, the first danger we see here that this passage speaks into is the danger of the drift from a passion for outsiders to pacifying insiders. Now, I'm not talking about focusing on, uh, you know, being only having seeker-sensitive church services. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm talking about when we slowly stop focusing on the mission we're called to and start focusing more on ourselves and our own comforts and our own traditions. You often see it, in fact, and it happens with every church. You see it with church plants. It's amazing how often a church gets established and planted and, you know, there's zeal. Uh, where the members are, are, you know, wanting to be faithful and, you know, work for the, the Great Commission and, uh, and folk come. I'm not talking about transfer growth, talking about new believers. And there's, a regular, there's regular baptisms and it's great. But it's amazing how after some time you kind of see those numbers of baptisms start plateauing. You know, we see it. In fact, we see it in every single church. But we also subtly do it ourselves. You see, we we so easily validate, or we so easily can say, nowadays, you know, where the world is shouting this at us, that I have to look after myself first. You know, and we validate our decisions along those lines. We make it about ourselves and the comforts and the traditions that mean the most to us. Now, there's a very subtle warning of that here. See, in church, you know, not just a recent church plant, but we see that playing out you know, where, where we see a decline in the members the, of the body serving one another. I'm not just talking about, you know, tea and coffee on Sundays, but caring for one another, you know, in one another's homes or, or connecting with one another. We know that's a challenge. No. That's the first shift. But the second shift is something more explicit, is we see the drift from grace to law. Remember that, like I said, the ones that were calling for circum circumcision here, they were saved they understood that they were saved by grace. But after a while, they started drifting back to the rules-based relationship that they understood with God. That was their default. No, you know, circumcision, Jewish law, maybe not the issue for us. But we have a similar default. We subtly do the same. Now, how do we do that? Well, you know, in many instances, we build a list of norms, and these are often good things, you know, things like spiritual disciplines even, church attendance, uh, serving in church, um, maybe things like keeping track of, of quiet times, or hours, you know, spent studying the Explore course, maybe even working out, you know, keeping track of how many times, how many people you've been able to share the gospel with, good things things that we're called to, that in fact we've been saved to do, amazing things, all good stuff, which are fruits of our transformed hearts, but which should always be the outworking of our faith. But you see, when these become the measure of our spiritual lives, 
and how we, you know, very easily find ourselves measuring others, well, then we sat, very subtly start drifting back from grace to law. Friends, there's a deep, deep tragedy when we find ourselves there, you know, as individuals and, and church alike. See, not only do we start losing the gospel in our own lives, but we also make it difficult for others to come to God. Now, the third drift is what normally happens after that second one, you know, after you shift from grace to law. And that's that we drift, or can drift, from a focus on internal transformation to external conformity. Okay, it's a drift that happens when we lose our, when we change our focus from internal transformation, the work that the Lord is doing in our hearts and lives, convicting us of sin, turning to His grace daily, and start making it more a measure of external conformity. Some might say, you know, that's what I was doing when I changed my, my wardrobe at uh, agricultural college and uh, a theological college, you know, I was conforming uh, on the outside. But, you know, in reality, we've got to be careful that we don't do that to ourselves and create those levels of expectations. We forget that the gospel's focus is pri primarily, primarily transformation of the heart. And that the essence of, of this is loving God and loving others. That everything is an outworking from that. And friends, that only happens, that only happens through Christ working in our hearts. Now, all through this passage, all through this passage, while they address this issue, it's clear that there is one absolute that's being referred to, and that's the transformed heart done by grace. Friends, Peter said it, that it's grace. It's by the grace of God that he transformed the hearts, Jew and Gentile alike. And it's grace. Okay, the, the Lord uses the law. Okay, we're not saying, we're not being anti-law here by any means. But it is not grace plus law. It is grace. And you see, as Christians, we have to be very careful when we start placing a measure of other absolutes on top of that, like they did with circumcision, the gospel plus circumcision. Now, you know, often we need to talk about it. They debated it. We, we, need, to, we, we, we need to thrash that out, open God's word and uh, debate that for the sake of the church. But we've always got to be aware when the focus shifts from internal transformation to external conformity. See, for many Christians, maybe you've grown up in some of those communities, um, days gone by, it's been about conforming to the dress code or, or conforming to how, how one you know, uses alcohol. Um, maybe for some, even you know, for many, uh, we're still even affected by our views of tattoos. You know, told that tattoos... You know, it's, it's not what we do, and so forth. Now, I'm going to push a, a, a little bit here. Uh, it's not going to be long. We're going to land that plane now. But I'm going to push a little bit here because I think, uh, I feel like I need to. Is we live in a world that is divisive and that is dividing left, right, and center today. And the issue that we have and that we've got to be so careful of within the church, you know, within our context, our community, is not the issue of circumcision, but man, it's, it's our views on COVID. It's, it's our views on v vaccination or, or those who are, are not for vaccination. By the way, I'm for vaccination. I've had my shots. Okay. I will encourage, um, you know, the, the responsible um, uh, trust in the medical professionals that the Lord has given us with. Not, not in terms of faith like we do our Savior by any means. But what we have to be careful about is how we polarize those two different views, whether you're for it or, or against it, and how we can impose that uh, on others. And we've got to be careful about adding on. 
We've got to be careful about adding on. Friends, we are saved by grace. Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, gave His body and blood, gave His life for us, forgiven, set free, penalty paid through His atoning death. We haven't earned it. We haven't had to prove ourselves to God. We didn't deserve it. But grace, grace. And we've got to be so careful so careful that we don't draw a dividing line within the church by adding another absolute onto that grace. See, because when we do that, we'll be divided by something that's additional to the gospel. And do you know in reality what that is? That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. So I'm not saying... I'm not saying don't have different opinions. I'm not saying don't have different views. But we've got to be careful about judging others. Judging others' faith according to what we've added to that. And there's danger in that. Friends, grace. Peter says it here, verse 8. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Friends, circumcision was a sign of the old covenant. Through faith in the fact that the very Son of God came to the world, gave of himself that all who would believe in him and repent we are saved by grace. We are saved through that gift, that free gift, that once for all atoning work of what the Lord has done for you. So don't feel that you have to earn it. Don't feel that there's any expectation. There's a number of realities of the outworking of our faith. The law is good and right and perfect. It points us to the reality of God. But be very careful about adding to this gospel. It is done. It is sufficient. He has said it is finished. And that's his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the grace that you have given us. We thank you for the fact that even when we see these subtle warnings, you know, these little alarm bells in our own lives as to how, you know, we so easily make it about ourselves, how we put, uh, you know, measures on one another and within the church and that. Father, we thank you that it is that same atoning grace shown at the cross which tells us that we are forgiven for that. And so, Father, Lord, in your kindness, by your spirit at work within us, Father, help us press into that grace. Help us understand the immensity of that. Help us see the importance of not just understanding that for ourselves, Lord, but removing any barriers so that those who you have chosen, those who you have sent your son to save can come in and respond to that grace and know that grace. Lord, we pray for us as a church, will you shape us in that way? Grow us in that understanding. And our prayer is that we are never amazed, never not amazed by who you are. And so, Lord, now as we come to this, your table, to the Lord's Supper, to the reminder of your grace given for us, Father, cause us not to do this legalistically or traditionally, in an attitude of worship, thanking you for your gift. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.